When you look actually at the years leading up to 293, when it's established, there isn't a great deal of foreign threat in those years leading up to 293 in a way that suggests that it wasn't a crisis on the borders. I think Diocletian, in his very problem solver manner, because that's really what he is, he's the ultimate problem solver emperor. Mm. He is thinking, well, Carousius is symptomatic of a larger problem that has been the case for decades now. How do we prevent the army and the provincial aristocrats from setting up usurpers against us? Mm. Is you have an emperor on every major frontier, and so you have Constantius near the Rhine, you have Maximian near the upper Danube in northern Italy, you have Galerius, well, Galerius and Diocletian. They swap territories. Yeah, so sometimes one of them is on the eastern frontier and the other one is in the middle and lower Danube, mm. yeah, in the Balkans, and which is also an indication that there aren't strong divisions yet. Yeah. There seems to be some kind of division between east and west, but we even see laws where for example, the proconsul of Africa sends a letter to Diocletian asking for advice on how to deal with the Manichaeans. We actually have a couple of instances of people in Roman Africa in the West, well, receiving rescripts from Diocletian. Diocletian's sort of keeping this, as you say, first among equals control over the Imperial College, but he's also using that college as this scheme of imperial presence and also, as you say, a scheme of succession. Likewise, I mean, his reforms, as you say, he divided the provinces into smaller units, which increase in provinces allows governors to deal with more limited geographical expanses. That means they can be, they can answer more petitions. It also means they have less power <laughs> to challenge the emperor. And likewise, they don't have military power because, as you mentioned, the administrative and military uh, cursus has been separated. And so there are there's, you know, these duques, these generals, the sphere of control could actually transcend the provinces sometimes. Like they could be, you know, the different Pannonia provinces might have a single dux, one of these generals, mm. while the different provinces would have separate governors. And so it's making things more labyrinthine, but it is allowing them to be more focused on their particular responsibilities and territories. And it's also weakening them if they should ever attempt to challenge the emperors. Yeah, because you need to have a larger um, range of support. You can't be the governor of Mauritania and revolt. You have to get your praises in charge of the administration to join it. You need to make sure the person responsible for troops is on board. You can imagine that, as actually the contemporary Christian author Lactantius indicates, People don't like change anyway. Yeah. And people are suspicious of change. And we know that Lactanus, for example, is very already a very critical writer of the Tetrarchs because of their persecution of the Christians. He exaggerates, for example, Diocletian's expansion of the army as if it were more than quadrupling the size of the army. Yeah. And yeah, he basically is one of the first authors to known literary author to condemn Diocletian's reforms from those from that angle. And I mean he's already a hostile source, but also I suppose it's such a it's a major change for the Roman Empire. And it is going to carry problems with it, but it is also in and of itself quite a new thing for the Romans to have that level of big change government. Happening. Yeah. I might just quickly just quickly just rattle off a few more important reforms just so that mm. They're not left unsaid because we do have, he is also the first emperor to create the uh, legal codices, mm -hmm. the Hermogenian Code and the Gregorian Code. So he's a precursor to the Theodosian Code and the Justinian Code. He creates that precursor, uh, which makes the issuing of laws much easier for administrators because they have these handy go-to codices. Because you had so many emperors trying to deal with the both military and administrative issues of the empire. You had this huge raft of rescripts for all sorts of things that wasn't really codified in any way. And by having these law codes, you could condense these down into a usable set of laws. Certainly. Yeah, it makes it much more efficient. The, the taxation reforms, as you mentioned, they create, he created for the first time this 
you know, it's a five yearly census of all the provinces in the empire. You know, they through the census, they know exactly what they what finances they will require, and they can ask for it based on what each household is able to provide. So they created these units of measurement that will enable that to happen. It means both a more efficient taxation system and also ultimately more equitable. It means, in theory, no one is suffering too badly from exceptional requisitions based on crises, that there's already an established system of knowing what people can provide and what the government will need each five years. He had the coinage reforms, he revalued the currency. So he's putting all this effort into attempting to make the currency more... Valuable. Yes, yeah. His imperial self-representation is also innovative. He, he presents himself as Jovius, which sort of implies some kind of genetic link to Jupiter or some kind of close connection to Jupiter without ever saying it. And he wears bejeweled sandals, so he's all, he's all going towards this quasi-divine image. I was just Meanwhile, to say you have a big revival and emphasis on the imperial cult during Diocletian's reign. You have this building up of the emperor is a descendant from and god, and he's and he, almost semi-divine in himself. And he brings Maximian into that because he makes Maximian Herculius, which also makes clear Maximian's subordination. Because he's a demigod, not a full god like Jupiter. Yeah, and he's sort of the son of, you know, and he's the son of Jupiter, and he's not the supreme deity. And yet, at the same time, they also present themselves as brothers, which is interesting, because that's, I would argue, meant to appeal to the soldiers. That's brotherhood, you know, that sort of metaphorical brotherhood was, just as it is today, you know, comrades in arms, brothers in arms, that was a thing in Roman society. And Roman laws even acknowledge it as a thing that had legal force for wills, for example. It may well be the case. Certainly the sources claim it, even though, but it may be propaganda. Even if it's propaganda, it's still, you know, important because Diocletian and Maximian, either they presented themselves this, this way or they actually were comrades from the Roman army, that they knew each other from the Roman army and he, they were buddies. And so Diocletian made his metaphorical brother, his military brother, Western emperor. The, the idea of brotherhood between the Tetrarchs was also a good way of showing off internal stability. So it's like you have the two pairings of the Tetrarchs are in harmony with each other. I mean, this is something that Carousius himself tries to get across, that he is a usurper and he isn't part of the Tetrarchy, but he mints coins with hands grasping each other to show uh, collegial peace with his friends. He also mints uh, coins with his and also their faces on them. They're all friends together, and I think that reflects also with the Tetrarchy. Yeah, I mean, there's this potent language of harmony, and I think, interestingly, Diocletian's, the, the Tetrarchic administrations seemingly, they like to switch depending on the context between showing Di that Diocletian is the senior emperor, which you see in some artworks, and in titulature, like, for example, Jovius, that and between okay but no these emperors all look the same and they're embracing one another and sort of they're sort of finding all these different ways to appeal to an empire and i think particularly to the armies to make sure that the armies understand that this is a united imperial college that can't be usurped against i guess to quickly go over some issues with diocletian certainly the tetrarchy doesn't it doesn't last the historian augusta has a great assessment of who Diocletian was as an emperor. He basically says that this was an emperor who was always thinking about what he could do to better the empire, and he was sometimes overbold about it. He was sometimes overly ambitious, but this was a good emperor and a proactive emperor and a real kind of thinker of an emperor. You know, certainly we can look at Diocletian and see mistakes, and I think that's to be expected from such an ambitious politician as he was. Because we can look at the Price's Edict, for example, in 301, where he tried to put a cap, a maximum cap on what price things could be. And there's this, you know, you get these huge inscriptions listing all these items and how much at most they can cost. 
it's really meticulous as well. It's like the price of not just like simple things like the price of wheat or silk, but it's like the price of hiring a car for a day or something like that. And it's like, yeah, you've got these ambitious ideas. And yeah, it, is, it does come from a good place. He is trying to stop the increase of prices, which has been a result of inflation of the currency. But that's not how you bring prices down or reduce inflation. And like what we discussed with Aurelian, the thing is, I guess that the problem is Romans don't have the understanding of the economy that we have. I mean, there's also hubris there. <laughs> He's, yeah. This is clearly someone, and this is late in his reign. He now he maybe is getting a bit of an aura of I can pull anything He's off now. Propaganda. Yeah, because I mean, and you can sort of understand why this guy still hasn't been overthrown for anything. <laughs> so he's he's doing well, but I guess also, you know, he doesn't have that understanding of the economy that we do, and unfortunately, his price is edict. But yeah, it causes inflation. That you know, sellers, vendors take their goods off the market because they can't afford to commit to those prices. Likewise, that he's the great persecution of the Christians. He's is again very late in his reign. It's the last two years of his reign. Having won all these wars and having succeeded on all these economic and political fronts and administrative fronts and legal fronts, he decides, well, let's change the empire spiritually. Let's finally stop this Christian problem because they're, they're not they're refusing to sacrifice and that's endangering this empire. That's why that lack of religiosity on the part of the Christians, which in pagan eyes made them... Well, atheists, they explicitly call them atheists. Mm. That's the reason why this empire has had such a bad time these last few decades. And so he finally tries to do something about that. You know, I mean, some of them do agree to sacrifice, which causes the Donatist schism. And so get reports of officials that they, they'd say that person X has done a sacrifice when they haven't because they don't really fancy executing mm. large numbers of their people. Yeah, because... Be people they know. And that's it. Not every governor is a sadist. Yeah. <laughs> so, like you have a very uh, famous example of Constantius, which may or not be propaganda, but where he gets the edict and he decides to demolish Christian churches, but doesn't personally mm. Yes, one of the, the few instances we can find of um, one of the Tetrarchs refusing to mm. only following Diocletian's He's orders. The letter in minimal. of his yes. persecution, but not the spirit. Yes. And of course, that persecution causes a lot of troubles. Mm. And you get letters from it as well, like St. George. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, and St. Sebastian. It becomes a sort of. Uh, storytelling period where you can create new martyrs out of the ex, you know the existing context and i guess the last big thing is yeah the tetrarchy ultimately not working and i guess it was a short-term solution and presumably diocletian was trying to make it a long-term solution because he was setting up this system of succession the scheme of succession but it's one of those system, those arrangements that was working so long as diocletian was there to hold it together as far as we can tell and because clearly he had a lot of, you know, he had exceptional influence over those three colleagues, it appears. It's sort of amazing that they could function the way they did. And I think a lot of that does come down to Diocletian's personal influence. Mm. And that is sort of a trope of fourth century historiography, that he was an extremely influential person over his colleagues. Yeah. Julian in his satire, The Caesars, has Diocletian enter the, this fictional banquet of the gods with the other three tetrarchs essentially linked arms dancing around him. Um, but, <laughs> yes. but yeah, it's, it's, it was an unusual arrangement that worked in securing a stable 21 years. But yeah, it, it ultimately didn't work as a long-term solution. There's a lot of debate in modern scholarship about why this happened. I know a lot of British scholars favour Lactantius, who claims that... Diocletian didn't co-opt Constantine and Maxentius, the sons of Constantius and Maximian, respectively, mm. because Galerius basically pressured him into it. I guess we can deal with this a little more when we get to Galerius. But, for example, German scholarship is very much on the other side of that, which is that Lactantius is... This serves his invective. And I, I, I'm inclined to agree with that, that this is... 
it's a subversive kind of invective what he's doing, where there's this trope of the all-controlling Diocletian, and he's sort of turning him into an impotent, frail, old coward in his account. And I think what really this is, is Diocletian is a man of his time. He is someone who took power and who rose through the ranks probably from the two, he probably entered the army in the 260s or something. And he saw what happens to dynasts without military experience, like Quintilus or Florian, or the sons of Gallienus, the grandsons of Valerian. It, it's not a, the third century is just not a good look for successful dynastic succession, even compared to the succession of other emperors. Like, it's been a period where succession in general is difficult to pull off. The most successful emperors of this period, in the eyes of someone like Diocletian, would be Aurelian and Probus and Claudius Gothicus, people who were career officers. And so he is relying on career officers like Maximian and Galerius and Constantius and the Severus II yeah. and Licinius. But ultimately, I guess the problem is, <laughs> for all his early success, by 305, he has effectively established a dynasty whether he likes it or not. Yeah. And he clearly has underestimated the degree to which Constantine and Maxentius actually have an aura of legitimacy because of the success of the Tetrarchs, even though it seems he's still thinking in terms of, well, we need a career officer and then maybe Constantine and Maxentius will have enough military legitimacy eventually to join the Imperial College. But, you know, they're not quite there yet it's 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 a it's a topic of a lot of debate but that's my take on it i think he was a very ambitious character who didn't always make the right decision but that's sort of what you expect from someone like that yeah i mean i wouldn't say it, it should be completely ruled out because galerius being caesar would have been in a very prime position to affect diocletian's decision and I should be, I should add nuance to that. I do agree that there's, you know, these things are never black and white. And it would not surprise me that Galerius did have some influence over the decision. I mean, the two people who succeeded, the two new Caesars were both friends or, well, one was a nephew of Galerius. Yeah. And there's every reason to believe Galerius was an influential figure after winning such a notable victory over the Persians and often being in the same palace as Diocletian in a way that Constantius and Maximian rarely were. I mean, Diocletian had seen Maximian all of three times, perhaps, within that 21-year period, which is kind of amazing. Galerius was able to tailor things for himself, but I think also Diocletian had a very untraditional understanding of succession anyway, because, I mean, he also did abdicate seemingly to supervise his own succession because he perhaps because he could have understood it would be a controversial succession, perhaps. Hmm. And Get Maximian to do it as well. And a couple of years less than he had. So Constantine and Maxentius still exist no matter who becomes Caesar. So you kind of want to control this succession in a careful manner. And yes, you he's trying to make Maximian abdicate as well. Um and so he's, he does have an unconventional approach to the succession. And I think he also he's probably wanting to give room to Constantius and Galerius to actually have positions that they can be promoted into that. Because Constantius seems to be a similar age to Maximian, at least. And we don't really know the age of Galerius. But we know that, for example, there are no woman is called an empress in this period or, or an Augusta, which again sort of suggests this unusual approach to dynasty. Likewise, no sons ever appear. Their imperial status is not recognised during this period. Like, we have an inscription of Maxentius before he became emperor, and he is referred to as man of senatorial rank, whereas his wife, a daughter of Galerius, is woman of most noble rank, which, is, so in other words, biological sons have lesser status than the imperial women, yeah. which is interesting. So something's going on there that like Tantius isn't going into, but there's something else about Diocletian's approach to dynasty and succession. But also I totally agree that the, the new Caesars are allies of Galerius. And so Galerius and Galerius was in a position to influence him. So I think it's, it's a bit of both yeah. what's really going on. 